Hi, I'm Federica Roeder, and I'm the moderator of the Los Angeles Gucci Group. Uh, all eight of us here tonight, all artists, uh, we're part of the Los Angeles Art Association. And this is the um, exhibition that we put together uh, for the end of our year, the culmination of our year. Uh, one thing I want to point out is we're very COVID, we've been very COVID uh, compliant. We've, we've had our critique groups actually happen in driveways, on sidewalks, in backyards, and also in a Zoom format. And the only time you'll see someone without a mask is when they're talking into the mic. So um, everyone else has a mask on. We're very grateful uh, to be here tonight. Uh, thank you to More York Gallery right here in Highland Park on New York Avenue for lending us their space and also putting together the installation. We couldn't have done it without this particular gallery. So thank you. We're also extremely happy to have the famous Matt Gleason as our master of ceremony. He is an art professional, a provocateur, a very recent gallerist of Coagula in Chinatown bringing that uh, area to life uh, in the art community there. And um, tonight, we are, we're just very happy to be here. There are eight artists, and the thread that really pulls us together with the Enchanted Ones is that we persisted through COVID with all the difficulties everyone has been facing in our country. And uh, we kept meeting. We, kept, we did Zoom meetings, as I said. And here we are tonight, and we're all very, very Happy to be here, happy to share our art with you. Thank you. Now are you gonna talk about your art, Frederica? Now the uh, next person to come on board with us tonight is our MC, uh, Matt Gleason, who's going to give us uh, basically an overview, an introduction of the exhibition. And also at the closing, after all eight artists have talked about their work, um, and Matt has responded to each of the artists, and Matt's going to give us a brief um, closing about the exhibition, and that will, uh, it's basically a, a replacement for what would be a real live opening. So we're doing our best to bring away virtual live opening. Thank you. This is the part of the opening where, uh, when the person starts talking, you, you know, you run out, you grab a drink and you just run out. I don't wanna hear them talk. So, but now you're stuck with this. Uh, I, w I was at the opening last night. Uh, everybody so, had masks so on. And, uh, say again? No, you're good. Great. Oh, Thank okay, you. Okay, okay. Uh, so I was at the opening last night and um, uh, everybody had masks on. It was good social distancing. And uh, the Moriart York Gallery is a great venue. Uh, the work was hung well. And, um, you know, it was, it was a great, great selection of artists. Uh, I, do, do, do you want me to start talking about your art, Frederica, or do you want to talk about it? I'm going to talk about my art first, but why don't you go on with a little bit more of an introduction? Oh, I just, I, I, look, it was, it, it's, it, the, these types of uh, groups are really necessary. And I always encourage artists, you know, you're, you're, you need to know other artists. You need to interact with other artists. Uh, when someone knows you and knows your art and likes you, they can vouch for you. Uh, I think it's, it's vitally important for artists to be more involved uh, with other artists, uh, socially uh, and professionally. Um, and, you know, you know, curate as many shows as you can. Don't wait around for the fairy gallery godmother to come wave their wand and, and give you a show. That's not going to happen. You, you, you got to get out there and, and, and make things happen. And, and these are artists that are making things happen. They're, they're showing their work. Uh, they're being part of the art world. They're creating their little corner of the art world. And from that, you know, careers can, uh, careers can sprout. These are all, I was very pleased with all the art. Uh, it was a range. Uh, this is what I call a showcase show where everybody has their own section. Uh, as a curator, uh, I can do a showcase show, but I can also mix and match, mix the work up uh, under a theme. So this was a good showcase show. Everybody had their own spot. Um, when you have a wide range like you will see uh, in this show, maybe it's better to do that because some of the work needs to be on its own uh, for whatever reason uh, and is stronger among its own, among its own art. Um, but some of this work would, would mix well. It wouldn't be the most impossible uh, curation. Uh, uh, but, but, all, but all eight of the artists, uh, you know, have their own, they, they are uh, arriving at or have certainly established uh, their own artistic vocabulary. And, uh, and there, there's, there's a voice in all this art. And uh, yeah, it was, you know, we had a great time last night talking about the art. And I, and I you know, I had certain assumptions about the art in the show. And uh, a lot of the artists dissuaded me from 
where maybe I was going or uh, if I, and, and I was hammering them last night. I'm gonna be a lot nicer tonight for the public. Uh, but I think it's I think it's important to have uh, professionals critique your work and 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 go at you. You know you got to thicken the skin and you gotta you gotta know like like what is your work about? It can't be about everything. So what is it about? And so we went at it last night a bit and uh, and had a good time and everybody was you know nobody beat me up for saying anything so I survived that and uh, uh, we you know, the whole thing was good and uh, tonight I'll be you know I'm, I'm much more familiar with the work. And thinking about it all day, avoiding the news, thinking about art, much better, much better life. So, Frederico, why don't you give us a, a rundown? All right, thank you very much, Matt. We appreciate that a lot, and we'll hear from you soon. Um, I'm Frederica Roeder, and um, contextually, I, I feel like I'm a Southern California artist, and I'm very attached to the California Light and Space movement. Um, most of my work does deal with light, it does deal with space. I've always been fascinated by really the vast horizons that Southern California provides. Um, you'll see here on, on, on this wall, particularly and also that wall, slices of my Golden State series. And the content of the work is actually very much about the sun. And I, I became so fascinated with the sun and how it has impacted our culture, our population growth, our recreation and brought millions of people to our state um, from all over the world and from within our own country um, to settle, to relocate, as well as to vacation. So I started thinking about the sun as one of the most powerful forces of nature. And, and I, I didn't want to romanticize it. I realized it's, it's, it's a powerful influence. It's a beautiful aspect of our, of our culture, but it also can be a very negative uh, aspect. It can be very forceful. The UV rays are uh, very strong where we live. So I, I, that is essentially the content. In most of my work, as far as actually some of the things that I think about and use as an artist, I like to just think about the edge. And I use it um, to divide up the space of the canvas. And I also use it um, as a way of taking your eye off the canvas. Um, if you're a viewer, you, you, you can be very restrained by the outer border of a piece of work. And um, I started thinking about that. Um, most artists are, have certain um, restrictions in their studio space. So I thought, how can I make the canvas feel bigger? And I do that with the lines uh, jig-jagging at very odd angles with no rhyme or reason. And also I'm replicating the concept of the UV rays that also refract bounce around. So it has to do both with content and also with the uh, method that I like to use. The edge is also important to me. I think there's psychological, emotional, and intellectual issues that we, we think about all the time as artists. And some of that, I, it, it comes from extreme sports uh, background in my life, in my family, et cetera, where speed becomes uh, an, an edge. So, um, as I, as I work, I reflect upon things, and that's very important to me, and exploring that uh, in my work. The other thing that I think about are like lines, and, and they look just like kind of simple lines, or, or this line, and, and that line, and that line. And again, I choose a somewhat randomness to them, but I use a line to express velocity, speed, and time. And, um, Again, it's, it's a way of saying there's a momentum to our lives. We can't stop it. We can't control it. There's some periods of time that we really love that we say we'd like it to stop right there and not move forward, but we know that's impossible. So this is a way of saying there is velocity no matter what we do. It's, our life moves forward. Some of it comes to, if you remember the Mustang V8, that the idea was to go really fast, speed, so the idea again, and it has to do with extreme sports, but speed, like the sound of light and all those various things, we just, speed is something we don't really understand completely. Um, and the last thing that is important to me as an artist is movement. And when I think of movement, I think our culture, we're just moving at warp speed. Even if we're standing still, our brains are going so fast and I often think of eras past when they sit and look at the Mona Lisa for hours. I don't think that happens anymore. So I thought, 
how do you grab the viewer's attention again? Because maybe their brains are just skyrocketing into some place. And I use uh, mediums, contemporary acrylic products that make the canvas shimmer so that if you're a viewer, you could be standing on the left or the right and the canvas moves and changes as the light changes and as someone walks past it. So in a sense, I was trying to grapple with this basically static space and, and help it to be come alive and not be static. And like up in that corner, a, it's, I blended it almost with the canvas so that it's very subtle, but there's a shimmer there. So hopefully it brings your attention up to that space. And then as content, maybe you could think, is it sand? Uh, what, what is it? You know, what is the sun hitting? These two pieces here, I'll talk about just a little bit. You can ask the question, what do you do in the sun? And you sometimes have a lot of fun. So beach back one and beach back two. Thank you so much. I uh, appreciate your time. And we'll go to the next art. We'll go to Matt. Oh, hey, the thing I appreciate so much about Frederica's work is, is anybody working in a reductive vocabulary uh, is kind of up against uh, not, they're, they're sort of challenged to not bore the, um, the, the, the viewer. And uh, a lot of people, you know, especially in a museum setting, you're going to walk past the minimalism and roll your eyes. And there's also a very macho, harsh, rugged uh, sort of uh, approach to minimalism that, that uh, when a woman does it, all of a sudden, uh, you, you know, it's not this statement of, I'm going to do the least for the most. It's, you, you, all of a sudden there's these environmental concerns and, uh, you know, just conceptually, it's actually, there's more going on even in the same reductive painting. Uh, so, but I've always been a fan of uh, Frederica's work. She's uh, a great colorist. Um, the interesting thing about this show is there's a lot, there was a lot of, there was a few smaller works that they didn't even zoom in on. So I think she's uh, great when she works at, at a good scale. Uh, her small works are okay, but the, the scale when you can really uh, en envelop yourself in it is uh, to me the strongest, uh, the strongest of her work. And uh, and I think every artist, you know, they 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 want to they aspire to work big. You know, you want that big museum painting, but I think it's realistic to uh, to also work small. So now we're going to hear from the next artist. Woo. Hi, good evening. My name is Louisa Miller, and I'm a part of the Pasadena AAA, L AAA critique group. Uh, welcome. I'm so glad you could join us tonight at the wonderful Moore Art Gallery. Uh, uh, my exhibition here tonight uh, shows that I've been working on uh, California landscape uh, recently. Uh, we're starting with uh, uh, a painting I did about the 2019 super bloom in Walker Canyon, and it is called Walker Canyon Big Poppy Palooza. Um, I, I have a deep love of landscape painting and, and landscapes and uh, a, a uh, constant awareness of light at all times. Uh, and I've had that since I was a child. So this gives me a way of, of uh, channeling that love and that uh, involvement. Um, in this particular landscape, it's quite challenging to work with this much orange uh, and this many uh, different elements. Um, as we know, we live in an infinite sea of data points. And when you're out in nature, uh, it can be overwhelming. My guide here for me in this particular painting is Van Gogh. So I am working within uh, traditions from, you know, uh, the 19th century at least, up into the 21st century, hopefully. Uh, and with Van Gogh, I was captivated by the way he uses many, many touches, many, many strokes when he constructs his paintings. He also must have been completely captivated by the multiplicity of visual material he was seeing all the time. And so I decided to try that here. So there's an excessive amount of marking all over this side of the canvas. Um, it, it's sort of, I use photograph um, uh, to, as a source, and I use the photograph as essentially a blueprint. So in this uh, particular situation, only a photograph can really see into uh, the close-up of, of the mustard and the poppies, and then way out into the distance and record it so I can work on it. Um, so this, 
this side has uh, lots and lots and lots of touches. And um, it evokes for me, I hope, that sense that you have it when you're out looking at wildflowers in nature, when the sun and air are all around flowers and how delicate and, and uh, delightful they are, there's a kind of feeling of fluffiness. And I think the Impressionists must have seen that too because they love to make lots of touches and it gives you that feeling of air and light around things. Uh, and that sort of, um, just that, that buoyancy of it all and the joyfulness of it. So I worked on that here. I tried it and I, I really liked it, <laughs> but it is, it's, uh, it's a challenge. Let's put it that way. Um, and uh, I, uh, this painting, I think, places itself in the 21st century because of, of the high power lines of the people. That, that was a random group of people that were uh, in the shop when I took it, and I found that they were very appropriate. Um, they're, they're not really uh, thinking about anything about me and my art. They're involved in looking at the poppies and enjoying it. There were thousands and thousands of people there, and we all got to share that, and I had a grand experience with it. Okay, so I'm going to take you now to a little bit different uh, expression of landscape in Los Angeles and in Southern California in general. Um, and that is uh, what you see from your car when you're out on the freeway. Um, this is kind of in, in the strain I'm working now, which has to do with everyday life, uh, as opposed to the extraordinary of a super bloom. This is like what we see all the time on overpasses and, and when we're on the freeway commuting and occasionally will be gifted with something glorious. It's, it's sort of ironic that some of the best views you can have of sky or even of the city are from an overpass. And in this case, that happened all of a sudden one evening. So it's sundown Wilson Avenue overpass in Pasadena. And uh, it was like, uh, you know, a marvelous thing. So uh, I, I tried to show how, how that could feel for, for everybody. Um, and, uh, and also, again, I, I work from photograph. I also work with oil on a kind of paper that will accept oil. And I got to play with how that works. Um, so uh, let's look over here. Uh, this smaller painting is, is a still life I just did uh, recently that I hope in a way evokes the landscape of uh, Southern California from an interior point of view. It, it was uh, an afternoon of, of tremendous wildfires all around us, especially, uh, you know, the, uh, I think the Bobcat fire, which was huge. And as the sun went down, everything on my patio outside this door had a sort of orangish glow. And yet I was inside because of the air. And here, here are all my little, you know, facial coverings because of COVID. So it's a kind of particular moment in all of our lives here in Southern California, and yet there's a sort of strange beauty to it, too. Uh, as some of us have seen fantastic sunsets because of our fires, so there's a kind of bittersweetness to it for me, uh, and, and that's and and that uh, occurred there. And the same kind of uh, event occurred outside my uh, front door. This is this is actually my front yard. It's called Shoppers Lane in Pasadena, and this is what I see when I go out every evening. And this is a sundown after a, a, a rainstorm. Uh, so that's the same kind of approach. What can we see on an ordinary day that, that uh, takes us up and gives us a larger frame of reference for life and, uh, and art? OK, thanks, guys, for coming. Appreciate seeing you. Bye. What I love about Louise's work is that whole contrast of the man-made structural and uh, and the landscape, the beauty of nature combined. Uh, I think there's a certain um, timelessness there where people are always going to want to be able to appreciate nature. It's always going to be there in art. And I think there's a certain bravery with all the trendy stuff out in the world. Uh, there's just such a, there's a, a bravery of anybody doing landscape. Uh, so my hat's off to Louisa about that. Uh, I like the really mundane, just ordinary, like a Walgreens, yawn, you know, uh, but but it's a fact, it's, it is our world and it is our landscape too. And so uh, with that, and then the, you know, the, great, the great painterly technique, the one, the landscape of the poppies, I was thinking like, we know what the poppies are, but are the poppies always gonna be there? And if that painting is in you know, New York, 
500 years from now, is, are people going to think that's a landscape of Mars, maybe? I mean, it just, it looks, it could really be another world. We're, we're in the middle of it. We're informed. We know what's going on. But those power lines aren't always going to look like that. People aren't always going to dress like that. It's going to have this, this kind of eternal quality because of nature, but this mysterious quality because it's really going to be locked into this early 21st century. So, so I really appreciate this kind of um, timelessness uh, to it. Uh, and, 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 Great paint application, just just really great, great color. Next. Start talking. Oh, okay. <laughs> I was waiting for this. Oh, you're waiting for hey, me. Hey, Matt, it's Maura. Hi, How are hi. you? And hi, everybody on Instagram Live and Zoom land. Um, so it's Matt. I can't see you, but I can hear you. Uh -oh. And um, it's interesting, we had that talk yesterday about uh, the French tradition with the black cat paintings. Um, and then I was scrolling through Instagram this morning and Jerry Salt and Vintage Illustration Gallery both had um, nude women or Greek mythology mixed with cats. Um, and so, and they're both turn of the century paintings that had you know, sexual overtones, so that was, really interesting to see these two new works in, in context of what we were talking about last night. So for my viewers at home, these cat paintings are a little bit more of my lighter side in terms of they're more fun, they're kind of a pop art layout, they're in a grid like this. And I selected these for this venue because they're at an affordable price point and with COVID and the economic challenges that everyone is facing, it's nice to have something that's small and collectible, although of course you can get a big grid like this as well. Um, but I want to focus a little bit more on some of these larger pieces. And speaking of Greek mythology, um, around June, I started to really miss being able to go into museums live. And a number of museums like the Getty and the Met in New York are putting their entire collections on a photographic open access database. More American museums are doing this than European museums right now although hopefully it's a trend that'll continue because it allows you to study masterworks at home. And so I did something which, even though I've been painting for more than 30 years and have more than 1,000 works of art, um, I've never done some of the traditional things because I was always more motivated by my inner emotional world and more of an expressionistic application of paint or highly conceptual um, complicated, you know, intellectually complicated works that were based on fonts and translation and, you know, issues of globalization and, and, and values in society today. But I turned to these databases and I was especially drawn to the Greek era. And it, speaking of Jerry Salt, winding back to that, also in his feed today, he had a head of a man with a bronze sculpture. And one of the comments was, I find this so comforting right now. And that's kind of how I feel about Greek sculpture circa 200 uh, BC. And um, so this sculpture is entitled Possibly a Goddess, which is, and it's, a, it's a realistic-ish um, interpretation of a terracotta head that's actually quite small. And the designation, I'm sure you know, Matt, um, Possibly Goddess is often used when they're not sure if it's just a regular woman that is being represented, that is being flattered by being made to look like perhaps Praxiteles' famous uh, sculpture of Aphrodite that we don't know what it looks like anymore, or if it was actually intended as some type of religious object or reminder of the Greek goddess Aphrodite or another. Um, but this, the, I love the, the languid expression and I try to really get a feeling of the weight uh, the actual sculpture is quite small. So what I've done is, is give it a sense of monumental, monumentality and hopefully sensuality as well. Although it's also, um, it's not flesh. It's uh, an inert material that's, you know, 2000 plus years old. So it has that hopefully unknowability too. Um, that for me made the original artwork compelling and something that I wanted to respond to and connect to. Um, we have another work that's similar to this. This is a new series basically that I'm starting after my last series was 108 font-based paint paintings. They're all based on translations of positive words into multiple languages. They're abstract. You can see them at moraq.com. Um, but this work is, is a new 
new just direction for me to go and it represents sort of where I'm at emotionally and, and maybe comfort is part of that. But um, speaking of the Aphrodite of Praxiteles, um, and I'm, for some reason I find that the hardest word to say, but this, this is also a statuette. Um, I believe this is actually a Roman copy of a Greek copy of the original Aphrodite that is in a small statuette and then I painted it and expanded the size. And the title of this painting is, uh, But I Look at You with Feelings, which is a reference to a Godard film called Pierre Le Fou, where the quote was, um, the, the, the dialogue between a man and a woman, the man says, I'm not sure if the man, which, which one's the man, which one's the woman. One of them says to the other, why are you sad? And the other says, because you only speak to me with words, but I look at you with feeling. And while I was working on this painting, um, the love of my life came out. And he was, he's a French film fanatic. He loves Godard and the French New Wave Cinema. And he said, oh, I just heard this most beautiful line in this movie I'm watching. And he recited it to me. And it sort of moved me and it, I felt that it was in harmony with, um, you know, just what the piece represents, what the mythological character of Aphrodite represents is, is the goddess of love. And I also think that tonight and with everything that's going on now, um, it's nice to think about Gr Greek culture as the, the birthplace of the Socratic movement and also of democracy. So um, this sculpture has, uh, you know, I try to get a feeling about the, the bronzing of the actual metal. So again, it's not flesh we're looking at, it's metal. And so there's quite a bit of expressivity in the, in the brushwork. And there's some bronzing going on where the, the copper was showing through in the metal. And so I guess I don't want to take too much of our time. We can peek at these pieces really quick. These are some mandala pieces. And then I'll just turn it over to you, Matt. And thank you all for being here. And also thank you to Claire. I hope you guys get to see some of the stuff that's in the gallery too, because Claire is also an amazing collector and artist. And he's put together this incredible space. It really is like a cabinet of curiosities. So hopefully you guys will be able to look at that too. Uh, yeah, you know, we, were, we had a good time last night, uh, Moira and I, uh, she's certainly educated and uh, and there is a level of sophistication in her art. Uh, the cats have such a there's a, there's a nice wonderful kind of primitive uh, painterly quality to them. Um, the classical the classical paintings are a little more refined. Um, but I thought about it later, and I was like, you know, the Romans at least I'm not sure about the Greeks had a temple to the god we might have forgot, and they would do offerings and everything because just in case there's a god out there or a goddess that we forgot we're going to have offerings to them because we don't want them to get upset. We don't want to upset the gods. So they, and so now thousands of years later, most people don't know the gods. You got to, you know, you have to really have kind of pursued it, read the Wikipedia page a couple of times. I mean, we know like Mercury, if you look at the boots, oh, that's Mercury. Look at his boots or Medusa. We know Medusa. But after that, it really starts to fall off. And I, I couldn't tell you, you know, can you tell, uh, you know, Zeus from this guy or that guy or just based on the statue, there's little things, but again, they, they start to become trivia. So in a way, all the gods of classical world are now the gods we forgot. And so anytime I see this, uh, a classical reference like that, I think like Moira kind of like expanded my mind just the other, just the other day, yesterday, uh, to like that possibility. So, uh, so I really enjoyed uh, the paintings in person. And uh, it's great when you see an artist working in scale, you know, a nice little painting of a cat, a big, uh, a big classical painting. You know, it's, it was, a, you know, it was the same, uh, uh, the ability isn't uh, constrained by size. So, are we ready? Next. You're on. Hi, uh, my name is Richard Blanchard. Um, I live in Los Angeles. Uh, I'm a painter in oils and acrylics on panel and canvas. And um, uh, I grew up in Maine on a lake. And uh, some of the things that I'm interested in that, that uh, get me interested in painting is um, uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs, modernist painters from the 1900s. And uh, I do a lot of reading about them. So it's very exciting uh, to get into that. 
and sacred sciences. So uh, I work on panel and canvas and uh, I tend to not worry about the border. So I tape down uh, the canvas on large boards and work very uh, big that way and off the edge uh, of the board. And uh, I use large spackle blades and big brushes uh, to build up a surface with uh, crushed marble paste and modeling paste. And I use like a thatched uh, type brushwork to build up the surface. And uh, I always remember Brock saying, uh, bring the viewer's eye to the surface. So that's very important to me. Um, I really like a handmade piece of artwork for myself. Um, this series that I've got up is a new series. It's uh, kind of in its beginning stages. And um, uh, it's called Emergence. And I use a lot of neutral uh, color palette, uh, clay colors, uh, natural kind of uh, use that I'm attracted to that are very earthy. And then I use bright colors to create events. Um, and uh, I like to treat the surface like a representation of the universe and uh, where forms are being born and forms are fragmenting and falling away as well. Uh, and in my studio, I listen to a lot of very uh, slow music, so I create kind of a hum at my studio, and, uh, and I can work for hours, kind of getting involved in my process. Um, and uh, the mystery of the hieroglyphs always follows me around. So this series um, is really about that feeling for me. And I don't really understand the language of hier hieroglyphs, but I, I study them and I'm really interested in the mood of Egypt. And uh, what I decided to do was create my own painting language of hieroglyphs uh, and uh, using fundamental shapes like spears, trees, and deer, and stars. I uh, like to um, use a cartouche shape in my paintings that's um, uh, fragmented and open. And so there's a looseness to the space. There's a feeling that the forms can change uh, all the time, even though that they're, the depiction is kind of in a flat land of space. Um, this, over here in this painting, I use the cartouche shapes um, to depict the woods and the trunks lost my ear plug. Hold on one second. I think it went in right. <laughs> and, um, and the idea of the piece, do I have that opposite? Does this part go into the ear? It does. Okay. I think I got it right now. Okay. Uh, the idea with this, with the cartoon shapes, and then reality at the back of the painting, rising up, making a kind of a uh, fragmented space going off into nothingness there. And um, over here, I worked on a painting called Four Corners Emergence around the corner. And this kind of helps explain best. I came up with an, a concept called uh, simultaneous gravities. And it's based on my studies of Robert Delaunay and his simultaneous cycles. Um, and uh, it, the idea is that there is no up and down in space. So pictorially in this flat uh, world that, I've, that I like to create of texture, um, uh, I have this deer sitting upright, and he's kind of expressing the idea that um, the human experience is the same, um, and he's semi-realistically painted. And then uh, all around him is this primitively painted representation of trees uh, sideways um, going that way, and then I have 
tree is upright. I have the petroglyph of the deer right here, upside down. And I want to talk about the critique group for a moment. Um, all eight of us artists, we get together monthly. And, um, and what we what we uh, realized was that by talking about the work uh, that we were viewing, we would describe what we were actually seeing in the work as opposed to hearing the artists talk about their work. And so that was uh, very important for me because it got that dialogue going and I was able to bring that to my work um, more than I was before. Um, and last night, Matt Gleason uh, critiqued us, and uh, it was a great critique. Um, he did say, though, that my work was all over the place, and um, uh, that kind of shocked me. But I, I brought him over to uh, Four Corners Emergence, and I said that I really like to do an entire series of Emergence based on the style of this work, and uh, he thought that was a great idea. So uh, I thank you, Matt, for that. Um, uh, and then I want to lastly talk about my studio again. Um, I have a very strong desire to paint and it's mainly because of the practice and the process that I work with um, is, wow. it gets me really wow. into making wow. the work and seeing the work evolve. Um, and then Amazing. there's all kinds of surprises with that process. So I have an idea going into the studio, but it's more that the process will figure it all out for me. And then I can make decisions from there. So thank you very much for viewing. Thank you, Matt. Oh, thank you, Richard. Um, and, and the Four Corners Emergent piece I thought was the most successful relative to the fact that um, the size of it really allows the viewer to, uh, to uh, just kind of jump into a dreamscape. And I think when you're dealing with, uh, you the artist are dealing with uh, these kind of, for lack of a better word, dreamscapes, uh, where you are sort of ambiguous, regardless of how well structured and, and how tightly foundationed uh, your ideas are, there is still uh, going to be the viewer that has no, uh, you know, that has never read Robert Deluni's uh, ideas, has, um, you know, doesn't understand that that's a hieroglyph, they just see shapes. Uh, but it doesn't matter as much when everything is well presented. And so uh, I thought that the Four Corners, the reason I encouraged Richard to go in that direction was I felt it was so, um, I, I just felt it was, it, it was so perfectly resolved. The scale had a lot to do with it. Uh, little things like this, sometimes a dream, it's kind of minimized. A dream, in mo for most people's experience, is vast and eternal. And you wake up and you only remember the last little bit, but you remember that it had so many more parts. And so uh, that to me was the, the, the fantastic quality of Richard's work. And it's something I hope he continues pursuing. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to see where, where his development takes him. It's good stuff. Next. Hi, Matt. This is Seda. Hello. Hey, Seda. How are you doing? Um, Seda Sar, and I'm very pleased to be part of this group exhibition, The Enchanted Ones. I was very enchanted to be in the presence of the rest of the group because of the fact that we went through so much in the last eight months. Um, not only personal loss, but a lot of different things that shaped my thought patterns in the last two years because climate and people are very much related. Um, but I started out in architectural school. My degree is in architectural design. And um, I've always thought there was a very special relationship between art and architecture because it is in all the environments that we inhabit and share. Um, I started out with materials that I thought would create the space and environment that is more uh, encompassing and it can refract and reflect light. So a lot of the Southern California, I grew up in England, 
So I uh, was born in Iran and I'm obviously Armenian. Uh, Sar is short for Saryan, which is a master impressionist of light that is very well known. Um, William, not William Saryan, but Markiros Saryan was a very famous painter. And actually I studied with one of his students in Yerevan, Armenia. Uh, for many summers, I was painting in oils, painting natural landscapes for about 10, 15 years. Um, but at the same time, I was also doing architectural design, creating theme parks and environments for um, major studios. Um, I kind of transitioned into the architectural work from the perspective of a sculpture, because a, a, a building is like a sculpture. So I was very drawn to Vasa's work, which we have an example here of Vasa. I had bought some of his cubes from the Museum of Modern Art, and I really loved the way that he was using materials to refract light and to bring this colored light into our vision. And I was always drawn to that. And so he inspired me to do the GeoCube series, which on the top here, you can see the perceptual changes of the cubes as you sort of a bird's eye view, going back in space and distorting really your imagination. <laughs> um, more recently, I've been exploring materiality again, using the canvas as a background or the mirror as a background. So I create some of these spheres and shapes and cubes and the uh, more geometric shapes using these ideas of materiality to explore the depth of space and our brain's understanding and perception of space. Um, here, I'm actually exploring light more. On the bottom here, I had just seen an exhibition of James Turrell and I, I was very drawn to his work. So uh, some of his works obviously influenced by Joseph Albers uh, and uh, all the modern historical Bauhaus artists that you know I studied when I was studying the Bauhaus movement. Um, they've, I've always been a big fan of Gerhard Redwild uh, and a lot of the builders, people who are building not just furniture but spaces um, as well as uh, bringing optical art into a, into a new way of understanding space. Um, my uh, goal is to be able to create this space, maybe virtual and real, that you can live and you know, enjoy and experience. So my work is about experience and it, it really moves with time and space. It's, it's a lens through time in a way that refractions change as you move around them. But it's not just about the materiality it's more about the form and volume. And I express those by creating a model in 3D in virtual space and uh, later on having it actually fabricated with laser cut materials. Some of the earlier works here, you can see influence of Joseph Albers. And um, again, I'm showing a lot of changes as the earth is changing, as the space is changing. Everything that we know and inhabit and share changes all the time. So my work is about change. That's all I have to say. So Seda's work, uh, it really does reflect her architectural background. I think more than uh, more than just a, a more ca more than casually. Uh, and I look forward to seeing where she is going with this um, this approach. It's a very linear approach, uh, but everything about her art is really is experiential about bringing you into the uh, into right there, yeah, into the work. And uh, so I do think she may end up uh, wowing us even more when she can uh, get some of these virtual things at, into into being sculptures. So so that's what I'm looking forward to uh, as I see this artist progress. Um, and also, I, I would point out that just because she's a geometric artist, uh, she's not a minimal artist. This work is very much about having totality of experience with a lot of things, not just a minimal vocabulary. And so uh, that to me was a, the, the, a 
very important. People see geometric abstraction and they immediately think minimal. There's nothing minimal about this work. And uh, I look forward to, I, I think uh, there's an old joke. Uh, it says that uh, uh, sculptors are failed painters. And uh, wait, 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 oh no, yeah, a sculptor is, a painter is a failed sculptor. A sculptor is a failed architect. And an architect is a failed god. So I think that Seda has a, a great um, a sort of foundation in painting to work, to work way, way ahead of where she is now. And, and, and I, it, it's, it's in a way, it's, it's, it's cool work, but it's very sensual. Uh, and, and, and the color, uh, don't discount the color either. I, I was, it was great, it was great. Uh, it was great seeing it all in person last night. So uh, are we ready with the next one? Have we, li have we lined it up? I think somebody dropped the earpiece. Are we, okay, here we go. You're on. Tell everybody your name. Can you hear? Hi guys, I'm Victoria Romanova and I'm delighted to be here with my friends from uh, Pasadena Pacific Road at this exotic um, mobile gallery. I think everybody from away should visit this place. It's absolutely unique. So in this exhibition, I have work um, that I work in the presentational field and abstract some um, still lights and some um, abstract compositions. I um, use um, just uh, free hand in work and um, my um, all work based on geometry and color. So for um, um, uh, still life, I use um, sketches and uh, I use my memories and um, um, from, pla from places and from um, different times. Um, I don't need to be actually uh, particularly in Paris uh, to create this um, still life. Uh, I just um, use. We lost her audio. We lost Victoria's audio. So this, um, I'm sorry, we're having a little bit of technical difficulties, so we're not able to hear you, but she's going to go ahead and keep speaking about her work for a few minutes. All right. All right. Oh, we can hear so, that. Um, this particular painting was created um, in 2017, and I was uh, interested in um, keeping um, tones together because I was working um, on the natural light idea that um, things are really soft and gentle. And the idea is here, um, morning light in Paris during spring. So if somebody visited um, Paris during that time, you would recognize that it's um, lilac veil um, um, reflecting all the colors. And I uh, was thinking about um, Francois Gelot, one of the uh, Picasso's wives uh, worked she did uh, in 1943. Uh, it was during Nazi occupation of Paris and it was a um, very sad painting uh, with somber colors, kind of a dark palette. And um, on the background, like in my window, there's a Paris happy um, and safe in her was um, cemetery. So it was homage to her um, painting. Uh, then Three years passed, and for this year, I created this um, uh, new still life um, during COVID. Uh, I was thinking uh, to submit it for um, com contemporary still life exhibition, and I thought, what could be contemporary um, nowadays? How can I, um, what I should put in the still life? How can I show it? So I use my personal experience here. And um, for the light, it's very important light in my work. I use uh, idea of electric light because I have lamp here and the um, contrast is much stronger than the first painting. And I'm interested in um, two views. There's 
uh, top of the painting is frontal view, and the second part is a view from above. And I was using um, ideas like if snake, there's eggs because snake come out from egg, and there's um, uh, seashell because it's also spiral um, form. And if it's a uh, scallop, maybe it's related to lemon shape. So it's just a play of things. Um, I don't use taping in my work. You can see that taping could be bleeding and I do everything freehand. Um, and uh, sometimes I have to get something underneath the color. Like you can see here is a green was underneath the pink because I couldn't get the right color. Um, so sometimes you have to put something underneath or on top uh, to, to get what, what you want. So I have another piece here and it's um, abstract composition. And I thought about um, participating in the LGBT uh, months of pride and I, um, I will support this moment and I thought about creating a piece with using um, all colors of rainbow. But uh, I also thought about my piece on um, snail piece that they had such an interesting movement um, on the circle of movement in his work. So I kind of used that idea there and um, for the um, um, main things I didn't want to have a center there. I thought about um, working around the center and um, it come out like I have two centers there. I was thinking about my um, stepdaughter at the time. Uh, she's supposed to get, uh, get married in April, um, her girlfriend and um, COVID spoiled everything and it was um, kind of sad time, but I know they will be together and they will have bright and colorful life and very happy. So the title is um, Together. And um, for me, this idea of light here, like it comes kind of from the behind of canvas and I wanted it to be warm and kind and sweet and love, you know, like to have a, a great future for me. fantastic thing I learned about Victoria's work uh, when I saw the show last night was that she doesn't use tape. There's no tape used in this. And anybody who's painted or attempted geometric abstraction or just, you know, very tight uh, painting, I mean, her abilities uh, just on a technical level, the aesthetics we'll get to in a sec, but the technical abilities are just really, really world class. And uh, I was very impressed with that. And, and, uh, and when she told me she didn't use tape, I believed her. So, um, and also I thought it was interesting that she did the COVID thing with the snake on the plate and she didn't beat you over the head with the COVID subject matter. Nobody's gonna care about COVID in a couple of months or a couple of years. You know, you're gonna make a bunch of COVID paintings and people are gonna be like, oh, and I thought about it last night, you know, there's no, are there a lot of paintings of, of World War II, you know, of, of the, tr the tanks and all? No. So, so I think people just, this, this rotten thing, they, they want to get past. Having something like that with a snake on the plate, it's a subtle meditation on a terrible situation, but it's a great painting regardless. And I think that's where you, you, you really want to go as an artist. And I was very impressed with it. All right, let's go to the next artist, please. Welcome. I'm Catherine Murray Morris. Uh, I paint in oils, landscape, still life, and figurative. I'd like to welcome you again uh, to our virtual open. I'd like to thank you, Matt, for all your insights last night. I'd also like to thank Claire of New York Gallery, um, who really helped make this entire exhibition a reality. It's an amazing place, and if you haven't visited, you should stop by. Um, I'd also like to give a shout out to my fellow artists in the LA Critique Group of the Los Angeles Art Association. You're such a wonderful, diverse, and accomplished group. I'm really honored to have been with each of you this last year, and I've learned really so much about the 
LA art scene. Now a little bit about me. Um, some of you may know me as a former banker, museum director, or financial planner. But what you probably don't know is that my entire life, I've always loved design, color, out of doors, and the arts. I used to take coastal walks and take lots of photos. And finally, one day, I decided it's, ti it's time to start painting. So I'd like to start off with my first work. This is slightly experimental. It's acrylic on Coventry paper framed in plexiglass. I didn't know what the subject would be when I started out. It was done in several layers. And in fact, because it was so large, I was really concerned I might run out of some paint. So I decided to do two colors, blue and yellow. And sometimes you have a happy accident. I then saw a picture of a little girl with sunglasses and a cape. She was standing there looking at the sun as though she could take on the entire world. And I thought, here's my subject. So I wanted to show her in relief coming out of the, basically coming out of the painting. And thus emerged Supergirl, an empowered, very positive young woman. Um, I'd like to move on to a still life example. I was very inspired by Morandi. He was an early 20th century still life painter, Italian, and he painted, he painted very much in uh, two dimensionality. He used very neutral colors, used negative space. And frankly, we're in a time of some chaos and division. So I felt it was really important to try to do something that would portray some peace and calm. So you'll see you have a flat plane there with the two dimensionality of the bottles. You have some three dimensionality in the vase but it's set against a very kind of neutral background. And I hope you'll find a feeling of repose. Um, in painting and in art, my, one of my real loves or one of my primary loves is landscape and the out of doors. This is a eucalyptus uh, at the LA Arboretum. Uh, it was, it was a wonderful morning. The sunlight was illuminated behind the tree. And so I worked very quickly in brush and palette knife to sort of, to try to really lay in the, the painting and get a sense of it. Um, also, I have to add, if you don't quite know what you're doing or you're running out of time, use a palette knife. It'll help you get there. Anyway, I took the painting home, worked on it in my um, studio, because I wanted to show sort of the effect of the light coming through the trees. By contrast, this is another work. It was done about two and a half weeks ago. It's reminiscent of Frederick Waugh. He was a early 20th century marine painter. I was at the, the inlet uh, at the Sandy Land Slough in Carpinteria, and the t it was a hazy afternoon. The tide was coming in, and I, frankly, I could have been California, the East Coast, or even Scotland with all the rocks and low brush and the water. I was working very quickly to lay in the painting to get the darks and the lights before the light changed and basically finished in an hour and a half. At the time, I thought, gee, there's probably more to be done. But then I stepped back and thought about it. And you know, sometimes less is more. So I left it alone. And finally, I just wanted to mention um, a, a landscape scene. Um, it shows the skyline of Los Angeles. Again, it was a hazy, hazy afternoon. But what was so compelling to me was you have this wonderful city, Los Angeles, but then you have nature that is all around it and is really part of our world. And so I basically wanted to portray that. Um, in summary, I started painting because I love beauty. I wanted to show the um, atmospheric changes and also just the natural world around us. Personally, I felt it was something that was tangible that I could offer. I have been on a pretty steep learning curve 
Sometimes it's difficult, other times it's simple. But for me, um, and for everyone really, art is personal and each person sees things differently. And for me, to be able to create a sense of joy or peace or excitement that someone else can enjoy, that is my personal reward. Thank you so much. So the interesting thing about what Catherine presented us uh, that actually I, I kept thinking about it later uh, after I saw the show last night was, okay, you look at that Supergirl painting and you think, oh, the difference between Supergirl and the painting at the Arboretum. Oh, it's a, such a radical thing. But if you look at that plain air painting or some of those plain air paintings, in fact, the difference between those and the Mirandi-esque still life, that's, those are two radically far, look, watch, they leaves, it leaves the screen, it's so far apart, see? And so, so th these are radically different approaches to painting. So you've got an artist here who's really tackling a lot. Uh, you know, a lot of artists, they say, oh, I like doing this and I stick with doing this, but I was really impressed with, with Catherine saying, you know, I wanna take a bite out of it all and, and find out what works for me. So, so I, uh, you know, I think that there's a lot of uh, rules in the art world about find a signature style and go with it. And that's, that's, that's good advice after you're gone, but, but you can see that, that uh, Catherine has a great joy in what she's doing and uh, putting together for us. And she's trying it all. So don't be deceived that that's still life has any, anything in common with those plain air paintings. But the two radically different approaches, that Supergirl is closer to both of them. That's almost the midpoint between those two. So, so uh, you know, keep it up, Catherine. Uh, okay, are we, we're, we're ready. Next artist. Hi, I'm Alicia Borg. My paintings come from the process of gazing into the patterns of nature most often into the bark of the trees. And that actually started when I was a kid. I walked among the trees and I was trying to read the bark pictures as texts and copied them into my notebook as pieces of messages written in an unknown and magical language. And that is how I see it now as well. Uh, my thing is likely mythological. Uh, I define it as a search for the primary language, a sort of universal language as a root, at the root of existence. Um, the language that has been named in mythology as the green language of language of birds. So I searched for it in the patterns and trees of the tree trunks. How do I read the trees? Of course, it comes from this thing called pareidolia, you know, the tendency to seeing faces and familiar shapes in the object. The images come from my mind, of course, but they keep it by the tree and I would have never thought about them without the tree. So it's always like a mirror dialogue with the tree. We kind of reading each other. And also it is like listening to the song in foreign language when the meaning strikes, even if I don't understand the words. So I try to read nature patterns as notation sheets. So when I go deep into this reading, um, readings, I see the geometry and primary structures behind all living things and on the other side, the laws of approximation in nature, of endless variety. And all this brings me to the moments of resonance with life itself and I start feeling like or oh, am I about to understand the language of birds now? So this moment uh, when the world becomes kind of readable or almost readable 
I want to capture in my art mostly the emotion of, of questioning of heaven. Heaven question. Uh, and I uh, I want to say that I use the uh, old Flemish master's technique often uh, many layers of glazes the technique that reminds me of a natural filters this is actually old uh, technique affected me a lot including the well, no comparisons necessary, but um, so let me watch this and then we'll. The, the, uh, the audio is out on the artist. Oh, hi. Hey, uh, I've been following Alicia's work for quite a while. Um, there's a couple consistencies of what she's doing that I, I really want to point out. She. Uh, she uses the same size canvas. She's got a very um, uh, condensed palette. So, uh, and there's a consistency of what she does. She's got a signature style. She's really a, uh, arrived at a signature style. So you know her work when you see it. Um, I think uh, what she's done is she's somewhat minimized the potential audience by having what might be considered a slightly gruesome subject matter. Um, but if you look at it, it also has a sort of warmth to it that, uh, that should be inviting. So it might scare one person and another person will fall in love with it. So there's a bit of a, she's gonna make the art she makes. It's a bit uncompromising. And, uh, and I, re I, I, I love what she's doing and where she's going with it. It's a very unique, uh, you know, in a world of, of so many imitative figures, figures she's really, really, uh, on her own. I mean, she's, she's, she's established herself and her style is unique. So, congratulations. So, are we going to go back and see everybody? Are we, going, are we doing a group shot now? So, everyone is now together and everybody can say um, goodbye and thank you. I just wanted everybody to get a chance together. Bye. Thank you for having me so much. Thank you. Sorry, I missed you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you, guys. It was great. Come on by the gallery. Yeah. Matt says it was great. Thank you all. Yeah. <laughs>